Hilltop Securities is leading the herd in municipal finance, building on a 75-year legacy of public service and trusted personal relationships. Through decades-long partnerships with local government, state agencies, and nonprofits, we've made a lasting impact on our communities. We've helped state HFAs make housing more affordable by providing mortgage hedging and pipeline management. And we've helped generations of individual and institutional investors reach their financial goals. That tradition continues as we find new ways to support our clients' changing needs. Hilltop Securities is leading the herd in municipal finance, building on a 75-year legacy of public service and trusted personal relationships. Through decades-long partnerships with local government, state agencies, and nonprofits, we've made a lasting impact on our communities. We've helped state HFAs make housing more affordable by providing mortgage hedging and pipeline management. And we've helped generations of individual and institutional investors reach their financial goals. That tradition continues as we find new ways to support our clients' changing needs. Hilltop Securities is leading the herd in municipal finance, building on a 75-year legacy of public service and trusted personal relationships. Through decades-long partnerships with local government, state agencies, and nonprofits, we've made a lasting impact on our communities. We've helped state HFAs make housing more affordable by providing mortgage hedging and pipeline management. And we've helped generations of individual and institutional investors reach their financial goals. That tradition continues as we find new ways to support our clients' changing needs. Good afternoon, and welcome to Housing Washington 2023. Today is our fourth installment of our pre-conference series. They've been great lunches we've had thus far, starting off with our speaker, uh, Rashida Phillips and Policy Link, Dr. Leah Stokes talking about energy, and then we had Chris Herbert yesterday talking about housing of the nation. Well, today we have with us a regular attendee at the Housing Washington Conference. His sessions have been widely panned by our staff, by, by the staff members, and also by those of you who enjoy hearing about what's happening in Washington, D.C. It's going to be a great opportunity to have questions. We ask that you put those in the question and answer session on the bottom of your screen so we can come to those during the session. But without further ado, the topic of the day is, David, what the hell's happening in Washington, D.C.? Well, uh, thanks. I hope it was praise, not pan. But the uh, um, uh, I, that's the question of the day. And the easy answer would be, how in the hell am I supposed to know? But it is, uh, without a doubt, uh, the most fascinating uh, time, frustrating, but fascinating time that, that I've experienced in, in, uh, in decades in working in Washington. And this is the crisis we're in, which took another expected turn just a short time ago. Uh, the crisis we're in was one of the most predictable uh, crisis and yet one of the most avoidable crisis that we've faced in our lifetime. So uh, I hope today we can explore um, you know, how we got here, how we're going to get out, and what's it all mean. That is great. We'll start with Brooke first. What's happening with the shutdown? How, the, how will that affect the normal citizens of our country? Well, the uh, shutdown was, uh, uh, A, it's, it's coming. It's baked in. It's been baked in for quite a while. There will be shock waves, uh, and there will be some twists and turns coming up, in the, uh, particularly in the next few weeks. Let me, let me uh, just go through a brief history on why this shutdown was predictable. Uh, number one, it started, and we talked about last time we were together a year ago, uh, it started with the election of uh, in 2022. Uh, Republicans, as expected, they captured the House. Um, and I, I shared a panel with Newt Gingrich, who I remember him saying, Republicans are going to win 70 votes. They're going to pick up 70 seats. And I was in the mid-teens. Well, they picked up five. And what that did with, with five, with such a slim majority, that empowered uh, different factions of the Republican Party, none more than the Freedom Caucus. So the first thing that happened was McCarthy had a very, very narrow margin to work with, with some very anti-government um, uh, members of the Freedom Caucus. When I spoke last year, I think I, 
might have said that the Freedom Caucus had 37 to 39 members. They're at 51 now. Uh, it's growing. You've got, uh, you only see the Matt Gates and a few others. Uh, 15 are really visible, but they've got 51 members. And most of them are anti-government. It's number one. Number two, close to a third of the Congress has never experienced a shutdown. So this is a new mm -hmm. environment for them. They've, they've never... They've never gone through this. Second thing that happened was McCarthy's speaker's race, uh, the 15 ballots, the secret deals that he made, the side deals he made with the Freedom Caucus, uh, blindsided senior Republicans, uh, particularly uh, appropriators who uh, two, three, four weeks after the speaker's vote kept saying, we haven't seen whatever the secret agreements were. And uh, Democrats were not comfortable with the secret deals. Third thing that happened was the debt ceiling. And well, before that, even before that, was one of the deals that, that became public and very visible is McCarthy agreed to put Freedom Caucus members on every key committee. So on, on THUD, on transportation, housing, appropriations, for instance, Tom Cole's a phenomenal chair. That's, he couldn't have a better chair. But he also has Ben Klein on there, who's a Freedom Caucus member. Every committee has Freedom Caucus, which stirs up a lot of mischief. Next thing that happened was the debt ceiling and negotiating. People felt he negotiated in good faith, 2023 levels. They were comfortable with that. And then a short time after that, he took 23 levels and given in to the Freedom Caucus, took them down to 2022 levels alienating some uh, senior Republican appropriators, but also infuriating Democrats. Uh, next thing that happened was uh, arbitrarily, after promising a floor vote, the speaker from his perch launched an in, uh, inquiry into the impeachment of Joe Biden, blindsiding Democrats, infuriating Democrats, and having a number of fairly reasonable Republicans scratching their heads saying, why are we doing this now when 50 some percent of the American public doesn't want it and they couldn't see the value in that. And then now we've got the, uh, the uh, uh, crisis on, on, on spending uh, and, and the, which I'll, I'll talk about, but McCarthy is always pulling to the right Three weeks ago, he announced that the stopgap spending bill that he was working on would have an 8% cut. The stopgap spending bill that he unveiled last night that went down about an hour and a half ago that failed in the House uh, had a 29.9% uh, across the board cut. So, so they can't count on them. Uh, uh, deals don't stick. Promises made aren't kept. And it's all his desire to give in to the uh, uh, Freedom Caucus. And what we've learned is a painful lesson that every time you negotiate with the Freedom Caucus, this is from a Republican standpoint, and you think you've got a deal, they're simply catching their breath, coming back for the uh, uh, another request. And they're, they're, they're playing out the immaculate deception on, on, on agreements that, that uh, uh, they always want more. So um, he's in a tough, tough spot, and Congress is now in a tough spot, and the uh, the shutdown is reality, and it's going to take some time to work out, which which I know you're going to ask me about how long and on all the particulars on that. So this that's was my next, that's my next question: How long, and what happens to McCarthy since he's made these deals and none of them have stuck? Well, let's go through the second. Uh, Part of your question first, what happens to McCarthy? Um, there will be a, uh, a move to vacate the chair next week. Uh, last night, Matt Gates, if he had to pick someone not, not to approach Democrats, it would be Matt Gates. But Matt G Gates spent time on the House floor talking to Democrats about voting to vacate the chair. Uh, so there will be, it looks like uh, there will be a motion to vacate. If, if you're Democrats, what a dilemma you're in. Um, it is, um, you know, on the one, you know, if you took a legal pad and drew a line down the middle on one side, it's you want to do what's right for the country and get everything you know, back into, into some sense of normality. Uh, but what do you owe McCarthy? 
uh, absolutely very, very little. And certainly because of impeachment and, and uh, the inquiry and other, he has not earned your trust or not earned your support. So when you talk to members, Democrats, senior Democrats, what are you going to do on this? They buck it up and say, well, it's going to be uh, Leader Jeffries' to determination. Hakeem Jeffries is going to have to decide how we, how we go on that. One strategy is, is they're talking about just voting present and, and trying to avoid the responsibility. Another Democrat, senior Democrat, I'll tell you who it is, Betty McCollum, uh, who's ranking on uh, defense appropriation, told me this week that there, you know, there's a, this idea that maybe there can be shared power, uh, that Democrats and re Republicans are co-equals in the House. That has as much chance as John Boehner coming back, being elected speaker, it ain't gonna happen. So Democrats, do you do what's right and try to get the uh, you know, country back or how do, you, how do you negotiate this and what do you owe McCarthy? It's a tough choice. It's a tough choice because if you vacate the chair, this gets to the Republican side, you can't beat somebody with nobody. And who's it gonna be? Who's, who's gonna be your candidate? You know, Scalise wanted to be the alternative to McCarthy in January. And there was, a, there was I had a Republican tell me that uh, if they had stayed in late that night, Republicans were uh, prepared to abandon uh, McCarthy. But the obvious choice is Steve Scalise, the number two person who would like, like to get it. But the problem is he's got major health issues, major. And it prevents him from being very active. And he's not uh, on the Hill um, regularly. So, so then question, who's it become? Democrats would support a Tom Cole or a Hal Rogers. I think Cole, Cole would get a, a tremendous number of Democratic votes, but I don't, I don't see Cole, you know, falling on his sword to do this or save the institution. So who's it going to be? So McCarthy um, is, is faced with perhaps one of the most difficult dilemmas I've witnessed a congressional leader face, particularly a speaker. He could turn left, work with Democrats on a stopgap spending bill, uh, get the government reopened and lose the speakership, but save the institution. I think the institution would be better off, but at a huge, huge price to him. And keep in mind, it was the Freedom Caucus that drove out John Boehner and Paul Ryan. So he knows that. And his life dream was to be speaker. So it's that would be a very tough decision. And there's no, I think he'd have a majority of Republican votes if he did that. I clearly think that, but, um, but it would cost him the speakership. And, um, um, or he could, he could go right, which he has, and try to build this fight around one issue, border security. Blame the Democrats. You heard you heard his press conference this morning that this is about, you know, if you vote against this, you're voting for Biden's policies on the border to try to shift it away from shutting government down to know this is a fight about, uh, about uh, uh, you know, border security. And he's also been dealt, uh, he's boxed in. Uh, the Senate stopgap funding bill, which will probably pass on Sunday, didn't include border security money, included six billion for Ukraine, which are non-starters on the House side, kept funding at 2023 levels. McCarthy went below 2022 levels in his proposal, and it runs uh, till November 17th. There's nothing in that for McCarthy. So he's he is boxed in and uh, in a predicament that that in a way he's partially responsible for. That um, that was visible, that you knew was coming. You knew this was a crash like this and a confrontation like this was coming once the votes were settled, and we knew how tight the majority is going to be in the House, and and it has turned out to be true. With the vacuum at leadership, what will be the issue that will hopefully get this uh, closure eliminated? What will what will move us forward or keep us from a stymie? I didn't answer the first part of your previous question, which I want to know how long. And then second, your your question you just asked is very much related to this. How do we make this as short as possible? Um, 
the the estimates range all over the board. Hal Rogers predicted to me that we might be on a CR until uh, after the election. Well, a CR after the election at 23 levels, uh, you know, one can live with that. Um, a shutdown for an extended period of time, we can't. Uh, Tom Cole at one point thought we're gonna we're gonna go until March. Um, that's on a CR, not on a shutdown. On a shutdown, it ranges from seven to mid-November, seven days to mid-November. Um, as I said earlier, a third of the a third of the house have never experienced a shutdown. The last couple of weeks, I've been asking members post Labor Day recess, that six week recess they had. What are you hearing from your constituents about a potential shutdown? And and I ask them, uh, Republicans, and I'll mention a couple in a minute, uh, two questions, but Democrats, I really ask them, focused on this, what are you hearing from constituents? Both parties gave me the same answer. That was nothing, zero. So the, the, the key to ending this shutdown is to make pain visible. You know, when, when uh, air traffic controllers don't get paid, when you go through a long line at TSA, when HUD and HHS and other, other labor, other agencies start shutting down, when programs can't operate, when, when uh, Head Start closes, when WIC closes, when the military is not paid, when border security guards are not paid, pain. Uh, they've got to feel the pain. And that includes Democrats who need ammunition on the arguments, and it includes moderate Republicans who want to do the right thing, and there's a lot of them up there. Uh, they're going to have to see and feel visible pain and anger in their districts, in their states. And they, the action is primarily in the House, not the Senate. Uh, so that's number one. So that pain might take two or three weeks to gel, number one. Number two, even, even if McCarthy moves the individual appropriation bills, which he ran into trouble on ag, but now he's now he's going to try to bring those up and then negotiate with the Senate. That's a lengthy process. Uh, it's weeks, not days. And and um, you know, I don't know how he gets uh, uh, to over the finish line with um, you know without massive um, border security money, and I don't know how he wins over his caucus. Uh, Republicans, uh, if Ukraine uh, funding is not uh, is in there, and keep in mind that you know the House numbers and what they're what they're marking up, what they're considering, um, that's the low point. Senate is much higher; they're at twenty three levels. And then you also have uh, President Biden. So whatever the House does has to work out with the Senate, and even if that doesn't work out, you have the veto pen. So it it's I see this as um, go, stretching right now uh, till possibly the end of October. Um, the longest shutdown was under President Trump was 34 days. Uh, this we may be, it's potentially, and it all depends on McCarthy, but it's potentially, you may see some discussions that this may approach those numbers, but it's not gonna be settled in a few days. It's, uh, there's too many, unknowns and too many political calculations to be made. Or is there anything on the horizon that will diminish this partisan warfare? What will cause people to come together or have to come together? Is it just pain or are there other things that could happen? No, no, the, um, no, I, I, this, this, uh, this is a fast, if, if you have any interest in Congress or public affairs or civics or government, what a fascinating time to watch what's going on in Congress. Uh, I mean, it's frustrating, incredibly frustrating, and I'm I'm deeply disappointed and hurt that so many members are unhappy, don't don't enjoy their job, and a number of them are are up in the air about whether they want to hang in there. And a lot of those are really good members on both sides of the aisle, I might add, and we don't want that. Here's what I think is positive uh, on the Democratic side. Uh, and, there's one other thing I want to explain also on shutdown, which leads into this. Previous shutdowns, the reason that they've ended is you've had a 
unified Democrats, you've had unified Republicans. They would go <clears throat> like two boxers. They'd go in the middle of the ring and slug it out. And after three minutes, go to their respective corners, regroup, come out for the, for the next round. But, but that time after the encounter in the middle, the time they would work on okay, possible compromises, possible movement from their side toward the other side. But it took two unified parties. McCarthy doesn't have that. And he, he does not have a unified party that he can he can maneuver with, that he can make deals with, feeling comfortable where where his caucus will go. That makes it very, very difficult. That said, uh, leads to this. Uh, things that give me encouragement, and I am encouraged on this. I think we've got 15 tough months. This is the new norm. I think we're likely to see a replay uh, of this uh, stretch uh, throughout next year with the added element of, of the inquiry, if that takes hold, and the uh, 2026, uh, 2024 elections. Um, so that's all going to be a factor in there as well. But what gives me hope, number one, there is a center emerging on the, among the Democrats, uh, a center that really, really are pushing to uh, starting to offer compromises, starting to offer uh, good policy. Some of those members are part of um, what's called the Problem Solvers Caucus, which is half Democrats, half Republicans. Problem Solvers Caucus. Others are what we used to consider and call blue dog Democrats. They're in districts that are always competitive, so they want to reach that middle ground. And they're growing vocal, and they're, 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 they're visible, and they're not silent anymore. That's encouraging. Second on the Republican side, all the press focuses on the Freedom Caucus is, you know, makes good theater. Matt Gates and a few others are, you know, Bobert and Marjorie Taylor Greene. That's good for the evening news. But what they're missing is, is the Republicans that want to get stuff done. So here's the factions. Number one, senior Republican appropriators, the Coles, the Rogers, you know, people like that, even Dan Newhouse, senior Republican appropriators who are just tired of this, absolutely tired of this. They were elected to get things done. They're also elected because they like to spend money. Second, uh, those Republicans in districts, newly elected Republican 2022 in districts that Biden carried in 2020. I've been working five new newly elected Republicans from New York, not named Santos. And uh, these guys, these guys want to get want to get stuff done and they're breaking with, with their party and keep an eye on Mike Waller, for instance. They want to get it. So members who are facing tough reelections, new members in districts that are competitive, uh, they're going to, as every hour passes, they're going to be more and more vocal about how this uh, uh, collapse and this chaos is costing them dearly back home. That's assuming the pressure's there. Uh, three, there's now uh, two moderate Republican groups that are starting to offer. One is a Republican governance group led by David Joyce. And the other one's a Main Street uh, uh, Partnership or caucus that's uh, comprising uh, probably 80 uh, moderate Republicans. What has happened though, the logical question that you would ask is, well, you got all these groups, Bradley, if you add those numbers up, it, it's pretty impressive. Why haven't they united? Why haven't? Why is it taken them this long? Uh, in years past, you would have five or six Republicans would feel comfortable enough. This is, was very, very true in the Senate, but uh, uh, true uh, partially in the House. Five or six or seven Republicans would feel comfortable enough that they would go out, challenge their party, not worry about repercussions, not worry about blowback uh, or being ostracized. They'd go out and they'd feel comfortable enough, challenge the party and try to build a movement, try to win. Now they don't because they're afraid. And and they're afraid to get kicked off committees, afraid that you know, their campaign money will dry up, afraid they'll, they'll be just uh, tweeted to, uh, to extinction or oblivion. Um, so it takes a large group. And I think it's going to take 40 or 50 or 60, other than the five to 10, to really create a movement. Uh, and it takes somebody saying, enough, I'm going to take the lead, I'm stepping out. Uh, they haven't done that yet for all the reasons that I listed. 
but they're getting close. And and I think day by day that that goes forward on this shutdown, uh, you're going to see more more visibility. And it is, I think, more than a 50-50 chance that there will be a united new group emerge among House Republicans that will help force um, uh, compromise and force uh, some significant changes to get government reopened and maybe, maybe start a long journey to the road to normalcy. That group of people, of Republicans who gather together will reach across the aisles to the Democratic side, knowing that they have 51 Freedom Cox members who are voting against them. So it'd be a coalition that will be bipartisan, you're saying? It'd be a coalition, and the, and the question they're going to want to know is, are my constituents going to have my back? And uh, that comes up a lot. Okay, I'm prepared to do this, this, and this. Uh, I got to make sure that, that the voters I care about have my back on this. And they're a little bit worried on that. I ask uh, a number of Republicans uh, in the month of September, post-Labor Day, uh, what the Trump, uh, and I'm going to give you one example, uh, what the Trump indictment, the 91 counts, what impacts that's made on their voters. And who I asked particularly was Republicans from red districts in red states. And I'll give you, a, I'll give you one example. Robert Adderall, who chairs Labor H, Alabama. He's very conservative, a very decent individual, deeply religious, and never, you never hear any scurrilous attacks on the other party, but he's fiscally very conservative also. They stood up to the Freedom Caucus. So I asked him, and here's his answer. He said, uh, indictments, no impact. If anything, they're more energized than ever before because they view Congress as corrupt, the courts as corrupt. This is all political uh, attacks on, on Trump to prevent them from coming back to the White House. So they didn't believe it, more energized. Um, I don't know if the recent court case on on fraud is going to change it at all, but they uh, clearly um, clearly right now Republicans don't have that uh, aren't getting any kind of of different push from their constituents about standing up and opposing some of these things. And the fear on this is Trump's party, it really is, and the fear is a primary opponent. So they're, they're, they're going to be awfully reluctant, a lot of them, to break with Trump, who's pushing this shutdown. But I think that there will be a significant number that if they feel others in their district have their back, they're prepared to step out. That's who has to be supported. That's who has to be encouraged and thanked uh, for their leadership on this, because you don't want to lose them. If, if you lose them, you're likely to lose them to somebody further to the right. And that's not what we need right now. We need a vital center to get through this. Well, gridlock so bad in the House, where does the Senate play in all of this? Where will they step up and take the lead? The uh, you know, Senate's doing responsible stuff, and 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 I like where they're at. I I I'm a Democrat. Everyone knows that. You know, my my mentor was Sergeant Shriver. It was a Kennedy family, Bobby Kennedy fan. You know, just uh, my, although my favorite senator was a Republican, um, but I love the institution of the Senate, and I I think I think the Senate is being very responsible. They did jam the House. They did put McCarthy in a bind when they included Ukraine money in their in their CR and no money for uh, the border. That was I knew that would that would be a heartburn for for Kevin McCarthy. But their stopgap, their CR, which will probably be approved either Sunday or Monday, early Monday, um, I think Rand Paul is going to slow it down a little bit, um, keeps funding to 23 levels, uh, is runs until November 17th, and uh, um, has no extraneous writers. It's a good bill. It's a clean bill. It's Collins and, and Murray to serve the, the credit on this. But the other guy to watch, even though he's in, in declining health, the other guy that, that I've always admired, he's a, a very effective Republican leader, uh, although a very strong argument, and I think persuasive argument can be made. You know, he's done a lot of damage in terms of some of his, his uh, judicial uh, actions, 
on, on, on uh, nominations, but but McConnell McConnell is important on this, and he has signed off on the Senate bill number one and number two. He's attacked the House bill, and so keep an eye on McConnell. Uh, and um, you know that's pretty powerful. So if you're McCarthy, you got the Freedom Caucus with you. You got a growing rest in, uh, unrest in your ranks. You got Democrats united against you. You've got uh, how, uh, Senate Democrats and Republicans, the majority united against you, and you got Biden in, uh, uh, against you. That's pretty steep odds for Kevin McCarthy to come out of this uh, unscathed. Well, you mentioned McConnell and you mentioned Biden at the end. And I got a question from Anonymous here. There's been talk that the general age of our elected officials is becoming a burden to progress. Would you agree that this is an issue for our country? And if so, what we suggest could be done to move these in the category of to retirement? Well, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, McConnell's health has been an issue sort of a, whispered for about a year. So people knew it. And, uh, uh, and so, and Feinstein's been declining for three or four years. I, I think age is an issue, right? very, very much is. You know? uh, Pelosi's still at the top of her game. I'm, I'm actually glad she's running again. Um, she's a prolific fundraiser, but I, th I think it's it's uh, it's a serious issue. Um, and uh, so your question is legitimate. I'm against term limits because who it empowers is lobbyists, and and so they're going to be the ones with expertise. And I don't agree with Elizabeth Warren on everything she says, but when she said Washington's not broken, it's rigged. I think it's true. And it's it's Wall Street and it's it's rigged. Uh, I was stunned one day when when I discovered about fifty of my Democratic lobbyist friends were all on on uh, Goldman Sachs payroll, all advisors and consultants. And I thought, boy, I'm the only one not on it. And uh, so I think I think term limits empowers um, uh, Democrats or empowers um, not lobbyists. Second, the best thing on term limits, though, is the voters. And and I worry with Congress having a 19 percent approval rating, you know, and that's spouses and lobbyists and relatives. 19 percent. Who wants to run for Congress but the bad guys? And so if 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 it's the bad guys running, believe me, uh, somebody in their 80s will say, boy, they need me more than they need that bad guy. And they'll hang in there. That's not good for the country. We need uh, fresh. So what I do favor is pretty strict term limits on chairmanship on on committees and term limits. Mm -hmm. And Democrats don't have it. House, uh, House Republicans do. Uh, Senate, no. But I favor term limits. That would, once your power is gone, then your incentive to stay, you know, into your fifth or sixth or seventh term uh, may diminish. And that's how I, I view it. And it's also the other problem that we've got, on that perpetuates the older class is um, their ability to raise money and how expensive it is to be in office. And incumbents always outraise opponents, generally speaking. So it's a problem, and uh, you know you've got uh, you know, you've got McConnell, you've got uh, Feinstein died today. Chuck Grassley's I think just turned ninety, um, and that's you can look at a, at a number and think, man, time to go. That's big Biden and his age being probably the number one thing people are talking about. Does he have another Achilles heel as far as his policies? Is it the border policy that's most difficult for him or is it the Ukraine policy? It's a good question. A um, few comments that I'll probably deny I was ever talking to anybody in Seattle when I say these. Um, uh, Democrats, particularly House Democrats, really worry that about Biden's age. They don't talk about it publicly, but they worry about it. They worry that he stumbles, not over a trip over a sandbag, but they worry that he that he stumbles, so he has a, a McConnell moment uh, verbally. They worry about that. If Biden's age shows, if it becomes a major issue, it sinks their ticket, it's number one. Two, then then if, if, if Biden's age, if Biden has to step aside, then it becomes who's, 
who out there wants to run? Uh, who, who's angling? Well, you've got uh, Gavin Newsom, obviously, and you've got the governor of Illinois, and you've got uh, Senator Klobuchar are all ready to step in. Um, the voters, and this is, I'm not making any judgment on what I say, but the voters would not want Kamala Harris to be the, the nominee. So, and, and I don't know that somebody from the West Coast or somebody from the East Coast can win Ohio or Michigan or Iowa or, or some of those states. So I think they've got to, if, if Biden stepped aside, I would look at a uh, Midwestern governor or someone outside of Washington to do that. But Biden's age is the issue, but he's got other issues cutting against him. He's got some cutting for him. Uh, the the uh, right direction, wrong direction polls, uh, despite you know good numbers on inflation, despite good employment numbers, um, the majority, and it's uh, over 60%, feel the country's on the wrong track. Uh, that is a serious issue. His approval rating uh, rivals Trump's. Uh, he's at 38, 39%. That is incredibly underwater. Um, this may be, if he's the nominee and Trump's the nominee, this may be the first presidential election in our lifetime that you vote for the candidate you dislike the least, uh, which is just an, an incredible. Third is crime. And uh, that is everywhere. It's coming up as, as, an, as an issue. And, uh, and, and a, few, a few other issues uh, like that. Any. Yeah, you know, Biden's done a lot of good things, and he doesn't catch many breaks. I think uh, you know he's good on the environment, but he's not perfect on the environment. So you get you get uh, factions and interest groups within the Democratic Party attacking Biden for not being green enough, or attacking Biden for not doing enough uh, for organized labor. But he's he's most or most pro labor president we've had in our lifetime. So he's got he's got issues out there, and if ever the campaign for president only focused on Biden. That's why he's out there talking about MAGA and Trump. If, the, if it were a focus on solely on Biden, that was what was deciding voters' choices. Uh, the accumulation, accumulation of the issues I've said are real, real problems for President Biden, the election. Um, and, and, and then who's ready to step in? But Republicans have the same same problem, and um, you know, it is Trump. And I am not not sensing any any movement away from Trump publicly among elected officials in Washington. That's House and Senate. If they're if they're anti-Trump, they've already announced it a month or two months ago, or endorsed someone else. But boy, the bulk of them, the bulk of them are hanging in there with them because they they fear a primary. And they fear Trump's wrath, so it is a perilous, perilous course, which I think uh, leads to almost a certainty if if it's Trump Biden of a very viable third party and running for president. You just mentioned voting, and that'll be happening again in about thirteen months from now. So, prognostication time. What's your take on who controls the House and the Senate? And for as long as we're at it things that may be interesting in a presidential race that we'll see happening between now and then. Well, um, 13 months out is a long, long time. So I've got the right to say, yeah, that was accurate maybe in in uh, the end of September of 2023. Um, let me start first with the House, just a few things to watch. Number one, right now, I think, I think uh, uh, Democrats capture the House. Um, and I think that's relatively baked in because of the, of the dysfunction and chaos among Republicans. That said, uh, Republicans are recruiting good candidates. Uh, 2022, they had weak candidates. They had some real nutcases running out there. Uh, Captor could have been beaten in Toledo, Ohio, for instance. She had somebody who just fabricated half of his life. And, uh, just, and he's running again. But overall, they, the Republicans are recruited well. They're raising money, but Democrats are also raising money. Um, so number one, Democrats take control of the House. And I think Hakeem Jeffries is doing a good job. Second, I still think there's some retirements looming on the horizon. Uh, and I think this shutdown, this experience we're going through may determine how many more retire. 
but but if I had to bet my last quarter uh, right now, I only do a quarter. Last quarter right now, it'd be Democrats capture the House, Senate. Um, there's a few things in play, uh, and and it's an interesting question. Never ask it. Uh, number one is what if McConnell has to step aside or is no longer leader? There's three things to uh, three names, and I want to tell you about two of them. It's Barrasso of Wyoming, Thune of South Dakota, and Cornyn of, of Texas. Cornyn and Texas, I deal with Cornyn and, and uh, Cornyn and Thune more than I do Barrasso. Barrasso is a little more conservative, is Wyoming. But let me tell you, Thune and Cornyn are very good senators. Uh, they work across party lines. Uh, they want to get things done. Uh, they want compromises. They're good for the institution. I would have no no trepidation if they stepped up to to be leader, uh, Republican Party leader. Uh, so so I, I think Republicans are in fairly good hands. On the Democratic side, uh, first thing we should mention is Menendez, uh, his indictment. It puts the Democrats in a hell of a hell of a spot. Um, they've called a number. I think there are 13 or 14 Democratic senators want him to resign. He said, hell no, I'm not going to resign. And I'll be proven, proven innocent. Um, but that deflects a little bit from all the focus on Trump's legal problems if Democrats have their own uh, legal problems. I think it creates sort of a, a pox on all elected officials. That's number one. If he does resign, let's just say that happens. If he does resign, and with Feinstein's death, uh, I think it empowers Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema to play outsize, even in, in, for, for Manchin, even a larger role in determining the fate of legislation and spending and things like that, which he loves. He loves to be in the center uh, on action. And this is a guy that's not sure he's going to stay in the Democratic Party. Clearly, clearly trending toward not running for re-election, toying with running third party, although I've got a bet with a number of Democratic senators and they tell me I'm wrong. I think he, I think he will. They think they're sure he won't. Uh, but you're going to have, you're going to have a, a cinema and a mansion really controlling the fate of, fate of the Senate. All the states that are competitive races, Senate races, are Republican held or a Democratic held. And so you've got Pennsylvania is, is going to be a tough race with Bob Casey. You've got Michigan uh, 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 with Stabenow retiring. Wisconsin could come into play with the right candidate. Montana, going to be a tough race. Nevada, uh, uh, Arizona. Uh, so you've got uh, those, are, those are, are going to be very, very hard fought uh, uh, seats for Democrats to retain all of them. And they're gonna to have to run in Ohio. I didn't mention Sherrod Brown. And, and Ohio is not a purple state anymore, it's a red state. So Democrats are gonna to have to run the table to maintain control of the Senate. So my prediction right now is that Republicans take control of the Senate, which means that we've got divided government again. And that's why a Cornyn and a Thune are gonna be important. Because if you ended up with someone uh, like a Mike Lee or a Tom Cotton, which you won't, or you know people like Rand Paul, people who don't believe in government and just slash and burn, then it's going to be a replay of of what we're going through now. Um, but but two likely Republicans, and then Barrasso is going to be a it's going to be a, a tight race for all three. But, but they're in, they believe in the institution and they believe that government can play a positive role in people's lives. That's a big, big difference from the uh, environment by some in the House. I do, I do think that there will be a serious third party and um, particularly if it's Trump and, and uh, Biden, a very serious third party. What I don't know, and this is, I talked too long, I apologize. Um, what I don't know, I keep watching uh, to feel a pulse. Is there an environment and a, a groundswell growing to throw all the bums out, to throw all the incumbents out? And um, 
so far I can't find a pulse, uh, but I keep I keep thinking that that uh, the more chaos and the more dysfunction in Washington only fuels the environment for a third party, uh, for a non incumbent, a non Washingtonian to shake the system up and try to get back to normalcy. So it's just a fascinating time politically and a fascinating time uh, legislatively. The other the other thing to, to watch for is if this shutdown continues, this will affect everyone in the audience. I think Congress is through legislating for the next 15 months that it's gonna be virtually impossible to move legislation. And members are telling me, and basically it's not gonna shut down, meaning it's not gonna go home for 15 months and draw pay, but it means that major legislative initiatives are not gonna be possible, that they're gonna focus on small stuff, but they're also gonna spend more time on the big on the big the big issue and that's 2024 elections there's a lot at stake well running low on time here but let's talk about some housing legislation so what's the outlook for finalizing the 2024 budget in other words what will affect be on housing and hud are we going to see the 30 percent cut you talked about earlier or will it be something a little bit less than that now if you if you look at um compare house and senate versus 2023 uh, I'm not talking the 30% cut proposed by McCarthy, and I'm not talking uh, uh, House numbers being the final numbers. Um, you know, that we're at our low point. Just remember that. This is the lowest it's going to be. Everything here on up is better news. So the House, uh, house uh, mark, uh, if you go through your programs, you know, uh, CDBG, formula grants, flat funded, self-help ownership, uh, pretty much flat funded. Uh, homeless assistant, ticked up. Uh, uh, rental assistance, uh, ticked up. Um, I look through, and that's a combination of House and Senate, but, but basically Senate. So um, here's the words of encouragement. Number one, you're not gonna end up with a 30% cut. It won't fly, uh, not gonna happen. Uh, I think, if I had to predict, we're going to end up closer to 23 numbers than increases in 24. 23, the country can live with. Uh, 23, the, by peace and functioning government, people can live with. Uh, Cole wants that. Uh, so that's number one. I think, we're, I think we'll be at 23. It's, if it's less than 23, it's 22 or below, FY22 or below. You got the Biden veto pin. Not going to happen. Second. Tom Cole, Brian Schatz, who chairs uh, uh, your Senate Appropriations Subcommittee, they're good members. They, they believe in government and they're, and they're smart and they're capable. And Cole will be at the table because he chairs Rules Committee at the table when the deal's cut. So I'm optimistic that when the deal finally comes together, whenever that is, uh, you're gonna be okay. You know, it's, it's not gonna be a slash and burn. I am not optimistic that we're not going to go through the same exercise next year with Freedom Caucus. So I just I think that's likely to be it. The other thing that that I can't predict to you is when people will be at the table on 24 spending. Right? Um, McCarthy has promised that there be no omnibus bills, and what has happened, and all of you know this, uh, in the last few years is that you get uh, the 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 chair and the uh, ranking member of full appropriations committee, and then you get the subcommittee ranking and chair in a room, and they decide. A few members decide that all the particulars of an individual uh, uh, funding bill, appropriations bill, lump them together, they go to the floor. So the Freedom Caucus is right in one aspect. There's very little input, uh, very little ability by a member to change what, what the select few have decided. But when, and he's promised, we're not going to have that. We're, we're never going to do that again. Well, I think they're going to have to. What I don't know is when. Uh, the logical time would be some of the previous times in the, into December. Um, but I think it's, um, we got to let the dust settle from the events of the last few days and what's going to happen in the next two or three days before we know. But there will be a time that 24 spending is finalized, or the worst, that it's a CR for, for, um, for the rest of the year, but at 23 levels. I don't see in any scenario in my mind 
I cannot see a um, scenario in which uh, housing programs are cut 30% or 20%, 15%. I can't see it. Um, I, I, I see good, good developments once we get beyond the next two or three days. We hear that housing is a bipartisan issue. So there's no probably chance for even seeing the tax credit program, see some improvements to it as far as increase in funding that's probably off the table. Uh, I think a lot of things are going to be off the table. Uh, and they're just going to give up. But uh, and I'm not dodging the answer. Um, it's 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 a good question. And it's a complicated question is. I don't know who's going to be left standing in the next two or three or four days. I don't know what's going to how this dust is going to settle and the will to go forward. I, I just don't know yet. Um, but on big picture stuff, anything that's going to require lifting, anything that's going to encounter, encounter opposition, I think there's going to be a lot of momentum to put that uh, to a side. And I, I, I'm involved with New Market Tax Credit, and I'm starting to run into people raising some questions. It doesn't have to be extended until 2025, but there was a push to do it now. And I ran into opposition in Congress and trying to even do the lifting uh, in this environment. So it's too early to say, but if he came back to me in a month and said, okay, Bradley, you ducked the question when I asked you, now I'm pressing you, what's the answer? I could give you a more educated answer. Well, you, you mentioned briefly earlier about the inquiry. What's gonna happen with the Biden inquiries on impeachment? A uh, few things, and interestingly enough, just it was it was scheduled. But I had breakfast with Jim Comer yesterday, who happens to be a friend, and boy, do I take flack on that. He's been very helpful to me, and and Rogers Guthrie and and uh, Comer, all from Kentucky, and they're all all friends of mine. Um, a few things. Um, Comer said, uh, and I'm not betraying any confidence, as Comer said that, that he thinks the hearings are going to be fascinating and newsworthy and sort of shake up Washington a little bit down the road. Um, so he's expecting big things. However, he also, and he's a friend of mine, but he also said to me on January 3rd, there's no way McCarthy's going to be speaker. He also told me Virginia Fox would never get a waiver to stay as education workforce chair. He's wrong on both, but but and he and he has he tends to get out above his uh, beyond his skis. But the pressure on him is immense, and I can tell you his frustrations not with Democrats. His frustrations are with some of the members that McCarthy put on this committee. Uh, so this is going to drag on, uh, and it has the potential of of becoming political dynamite, my gut feeling is it ends up a flop. It does. It ends up not making much of a difference. Hunter Biden might have problems, but Joe Biden, I would be I would be surprised uh, if if we get down a path where where he he becomes the central focus. Right now, if they wanted to move toward impeachment, it would it would fall flat um, uh, beyond. But the politics around this will remain, and that is McCarthy. Democrats are livid that McCarthy unilaterally announced the inquiry you know, when traditionally it's always voted on by the full House, and they, they will never get over it. Uh, but it's, it will be good theater, might be boring theater once in a while. I think in the end, the focus is Hunter and not Joe, and I think uh, at some point uh, it, it fades in oblivion. Uh, Comer disagrees with me, but and he's in a position to know, but his track record does not give me 100% confidence that his predictions will be accurate. Regarding pre the former President Trump, how many convictions will it take for the far right to let go of him and move off? I think, well, obviously more than 91 uh, uh, in terms of uh, charges. I don't know about the fraud. That, that came up this week, and I haven't asked anybody. I didn't. I wouldn't have this week anyway, because every meeting was focused on what it should have been, what's going on. Um, I would hope that the, the fraud, which uh, which is going to break up the Trump empire, the Trump business, would have some impact. Um, I don't know the answer. 
And uh, I told you Adderhall's comments on the indictments that, that his, his voters were more energized than ever. Um, uh, it's obviously more than 91. It's obviously more than these cases. I think I think I do think the fraud case has a potential of of changing the dynamics a little bit, but I th I think generally speaking, uh, 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 the Trump base will be there, uh, the Biden base will be there, which leaves an opening in the middle for a third party and no labels uh, party, and that um, um, as of right now, I don't see any alternative to Trump. Uh, which, which absolutely astounds me, absolutely. What will be the most important voting block? Union workers, people of color, the abortion issue. Was there is there an issue that would tip the scales? Yeah, I think. Uh, well, it's it's two parts to your question. Voting block, independents are going to be very important. Uh, women on abortion are going to be very important. And for Biden, uh, it's how he relates to blue collar workers. Um, Biden's got problems with youth and he's got problems with blue collar America. He's got problems in rural areas. Uh, for Trump, uh, his challenge is to hold on to who he has, that he doesn't get any fraying around, around the edges because that would give him no margin. Um, if I had one issue to watch that might uh, um, that might be the tipping point. Um, you know, I've talked about the crime and the border and all those issues, but again, abortion is in, uh, is packing an incredibly powerful punch, particularly within the Democratic Party. I see that as driving women and uh, young uh, more towards the Democratic column than almost any other issue, even 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 surplanting climate change. So I, I would watch that. And the more states that pass restrictive laws, I think the, uh, the more it energizes the pro-choice base within the Democratic Party. Here's one question I didn't get to, and it's about energy. The Russians and Saudis have slowed oil production, which raised the price of oil. The Saudis own the largest refinery in the United States, and they can shut down at any time for repairs. Do you think the Putin and Saudi manipulation of the price of gasoline will have an effect on the election? Yeah. Yep. And uh, gas, uh, oil is expected to top 100 a barrel. Uh, you're already seeing rises at, at, at the pump. I, I think, although the overall inflation numbers are down, uh, I think the last thing uh, Joe Biden would like to see is $4 plus a gallon uh, for regular gasoline. And that might be in the cards. So I, I think I think the price of energy is a huge, huge issue, um, and, and and an unknown. Uh, Spro, our strategic petroleum reserve, is at a 40, 40 year low, so we don't have any reserves there. And uh, I don't know what the forecast is in the Northwest for the winter, but the forecast in Mid Atlantic is we're supposed to have a tough, tough winter. So it's going to drive up energy usage. Uh, I think that's a great unknown, and any any disruptions geopolitically on energy supplies is bad news for Biden. Bad news. Well, we are above four dollars a gallon here, so it's already there in Washington State, and California is even higher than that. But we always end this on a high, high note, and we had a great victory last night, three to two, in the bottom of the ninth. What's going to happen with the Mariners? What's going to happen with baseball in the playoffs this year? No, but yeah, that's a great question. I thought it was going to be a political question. That, oh man, um, it's been a great baseball season. If 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 you're not a baseball fan, you've missed uh, a wonderful, wonderful season. And um, you know, that American League West is what you what you're talking about. Houston, Texas, and Seattle. That's going to come down to the last two games. Uh, incredibly exciting. And uh, National League has the same wild card chase, the Cubs, the Diamondbacks, and the uh, Marlins. So it's just been a terrific season. Um, I think for the World Series, Atlanta is one heck of a heck of a team. They are, to me, uh, day in and day out uh, on all aspects. 
the best team in baseball. So I think they're the team to beat. So well, I'll tell you, they, they've drawn 70 million fans this year, which is a great number for baseball. This year, Seattle held the All Star Game, which was a great event. Uh, I still think our Mariners have a chance. And we'll, we'll see how it works out. And if you're a Mariners fan, uh, you got good things coming. They got a good farm system. You, you know, you're, you're. That's going to be a good, good team. And I'll end on one thing. I'm a baseball fan. I'm involved with baseball. Some of the, some of you may know um, minor league baseball, but the best baseball I've ever seen. My favorite baseball experience was 95 Mariners Yankees uh, and for me to stay up because I get up at 3 30 east coast time every day for me to stay up and watch games in Seattle you know into the wee hours of the morning that was just the greatest baseball and that's when Seattle fell in love with the Mariners and what an experience so that's the best baseball I've ever seen and uh, and you're lucky it's a neat team to root for and uh, good ownership uh, though they might uh, might be available, uh, good ownership and a good farm system. So you're going to have many years of enjoyable baseball. Okay. Well, David, we don't we don't pander you. We praise you. You've been a staple here in our housing, Washington. Next year is a big year. We will have you back, hopefully in a plenary rule, because it will be very important for us to hear just before the election what's going on. For you okay. attending today, please look at the chat feature. There are some surveys in there for you to fill. And we are thankful you came in today. And David, a final parting word? Well, it, this, you know, I, I speak a lot around the country and this is my favorite conference. Cheryl is a wonderful, wonderful facilitator and I always enjoy talking to him. And uh, and you're, you're a good host, believe me, a good moderator, Bob, and I appreciate it. And I feel comfortable enough in, in telling you what I think. I hope it's not boring to you. Telling you what I'm hearing, what I'm thinking and trying to uh, in a responsible way to give you the ins and outs and, and uh, an outlook in Congress. What is important is, there to, is to understand there's a lot of good men and women in Congress that want to do the right thing. We want them to do that. We want to support them. And, um, and we believe in, in, in the, the goodness that government can provide. That's what all this is about. So don't get discouraged. Um, there are better days ahead. And a little luck to be here sooner than I'm forecasting, but I think no later than uh, the start of 2025, the tide will turn. Thank you, everybody. I sure enjoy it. See you next year, David. Take care, everyone. Have a great day.